In this lecture, we will briefly talk about the enzyme inhibitors. We have two types of enzyme inhibitors, competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, and both of them are reversible inhibitors. Let's start with the mechanism of competitive reverse reversible inhibition. This is the enzyme, and as you can see, the enzyme, it has its own active site. To this active site, the substrate will bind, and when the substrate is bound here, the enzyme will work on the substrate, releasing the products. So this is the normal mechanism of how all the enzymes work. However, in some cases, there are inhibitors. What are inhibitors? Inhibitors, they are chemicals that block the action of the enzyme. How does the inhibitors do that? The inhibitor simply, it binds to the active site instead of the normal substrate. So in this case, the enzyme cannot work. Why? Because its active site is not occupied by the actual substrate. So here it's very clear that in order for the inhibitor to bind to the active site, it must have a similar shape to the substrate. And this is shown here. We have a similar shape between the competitive inhibitor and the substrate. And that's why it, have, it has the, the availability of binding to the active site of the enzyme. Now, at the beginning of this uh, lecture, I said that this type of inhibition is called competitive inhibition. Why competitive? Look at this situation. We have the enzyme, we have the normal substrate, and we have the inhibitors. And as I said, that substrate and inhibitors have the same shape. Now, what determine what or who will sit on the active side of the enzyme? It's simply the concentration or the quantity. Here we have higher quantity of the substrate, so the substrates will win the competition over the inhibitors. So the substrate will sit down here, and the enzyme will be normally working. So that's why here in this case, when the concentration of the substrate is greater than the concentration of the inhibitor, the enzyme activity is unaffected. Why? Because the substrate can easily bind in its active site. On the other hand, look at this case. It's the opposite of the previous case. We have higher quantities of inhibitors than the substrates. So now the inhibitors, they will win the competition and they will sit on the active site impairing the activity of the enzyme. That's why here we have less concentration of the substrate than the inhibitor concentration. So here the enzyme activity will be affected. This was the competitive inhibition mechanism. Now let's look at the non-competitive inhibition. And as you can see, as I said before, that both of them are reversible. This is the enzyme again, and this is the active site, and this is the inhibitor. What differentiates this mechanism, the non-competitive, from the previous competitive is the mode of action of the inhibitor. Okay, so here, the inhibitor here, it does not have a similar shape to the substrate. That's why it will not sit here on the active site. The substrate can normally sit on the active site. The inhibitor, it the non-competitive inhibitor, it binds to another zone, to another region of the enzyme. Here it's in the backward. When it do that, the shape of the enzyme will be altered. It will be deformed. There will be deformities in the shape of the enzyme. So this will affect the active site. So the substrate here can never sit down or bind to the active site anymore. And why it's called non-competitive? because regardless of the concentration of the substrate or the inhibitor, the enzyme will be unaffected even if one molecule of inhibitor binds to its site here in the back. So this is non-competitive inhibitor in general. We don't have binding to the active site. We have binding of a different zone here, site more other than the active site. When the inhibitor do that, it disrupts the bonds and interaction of the enzyme. This lead to altering of the shape of the enzyme, so the enzyme function is blocked because substrate has no accessibility anymore to its active site. Finally, there is something in the body called the end product inhibition, and this is a mechanism of many inhibitors. 
Suppose that we have a, a metabolic or series, series of metabolic reactions catalyzed by enzymes. We have, for example, a substrate that changed to product one, and the product one is changed to product two. The first step is catalyzed by enzyme one, the second step is catalyzed by enzyme two, and the product two is changed to product three by the help of a third enzyme. So here we have, this is a series of metabolic reactions catalyzed by three enzymes. Now, when product three increases, this might lead to lethal effects on the body. Why? Because sometimes the end product, which is the product three, it might be toxic if its level exceeds certain levels. That's why metabolic reactions inside the body, they must not go uncontrolled. And this is an example. If this series of reactions, the metabolic reactions, go and run in an uncontrolled fashion, the product three will be increasing in level, leading to some negative effects of the body. That's why there is a sort of control. This product three, when it increases to a lethal level, or when it exceeds the, uh, the normal level, by itself it will be an inhibitor to enzyme one. So product three is playing the role of inhibition of enzyme one. When enzyme one is blocked, product one will not be formed and actually similarly the product two will not be formed because product two needs product one to start. The same thing, the product three will not form, this will lead to decreasing of product three again to the normal level. This sort of control inside the body is called a feedback mechanism and it's needed in many areas of the body in order to keep the levels of molecules within the normal levels.